as a biologist, as a neuroscientist, yeah. how do you think about this thing that we call hunger and absolutely, feeding? Absolutely, absolutely. So I think at a very high level, a good way to think about the regulation of food intake by the brain is that there's two systems, a short-term system and a long-term system that are primarily localized to different parts of the brain, operate on different timescales, one on the timescale of a meal, so 10, 20 minutes, uh, and the other on the timescale of sort of weeks to months to years and tracks levels of body fat. And these two systems sort of interact so that, so that these short-term behaviors we do, eating, are matched to our long-term need for energy. And so um, uh, uh, I think one of, the, uh, one of the initial experiments that really led to this idea is this great experiment by Harvey Grill um, about 50 years ago. Uh, it's called the decerebrate rat. And so essentially what he did was uh, he made a, a cut in the rat brain. So he took these rats in the lab, made a cut so that he separated the brainstem, so the most posterior part of the brain from the entire forebrain, basically got rid of, you know, 80% of the rat's brain. So these basically creating these zombie rats, right? all they have is a brainstem and asked, you know, what can these rats still do? And as you might imagine, they can't do a lot of things, right? Because they basically have lost most of their brain. Um, but he discovered that one thing they can still do is regulate the size of a meal. And so, um, and so, a very informative and, and experiment. So, and so, um, and and you have to be careful how we talk about this because the way this meal works is you have to actually put food into their mouth and then they'll swallow it as you put food into their mouth. Um, but eventually, at some point, they'll start spitting it out, and that basically is an indication that, in some sense, they're becoming sated, uh, and they're uh, they're just using the brainstem that they have left. They're able to sense those signals from the gut and uh, drive the termination of a meal. And he did other experiments showing that many of these signals that come from the gut, gastric stretch, hormones that come from your intestine in response to food intake like CCK, these decerebrate rats that just have a brainstem, um, if you inject those or manipulate the gut in, in those ways, it can in an appropriate way change how much the rat eats. Now what can't the rat do when it doesn't have a forebrain? And the thing it can't do is it can't respond to longer term changes in energy need. Meaning, if you fast the rat for a couple of days, this decerebrate rat, then start putting food in its mouth, the amount that it eats doesn't change. So basically, it doesn't eat a larger meal the way you would if you were fasted for several days and then refed. And that experiment, along with other evidence, has led to the idea that in the brainstem, and then the most posterior part of your brain, there are neural circuits that control sort of a meal, and then the, the time scale of 10 minutes or 20 minutes, deciding when a meal should end. And in the forebrain, primarily in the hypothalamus, there are neural circuits that then track what is my overall level of energy reserves? Mm -hmm. What is my level of body fat? Things that would fluctuate on time scale of say days when you're fasting. And those forebrain centers feed back to talk to the brainstem and modulate those brainstem circuits that are controlling the size of a meal to sort of match these two time scales. So that's at the highest level how I think about the neural circuitry that controls feeding. Um, there's obviously a lot more going on underneath the, that. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. You mentioned body fat, and that somehow the brain is tracking the amount of body fat. Um, that caught my ear uh, because while it makes total sense, I'd like to know how that happens if we happen to know the mechanism. And the second question is, why body fat and not body fat and muscular mass or body fat and overall body weight? What is being signaled between body fat and the brain? that allows the brain to track body fat? And why do you think body fat is the critical signal? I realize it represents an energy reserve, yeah. but certainly there are other things about the bodily state that are important. Yeah, well, there are certainly other things about the bodily state that are important, and there are other things about physiology definitely that are regulated other than body fat. Um, but body fat is, is unique because it represents this energy reserve. So the neural cir circuitry that regulates eating behavior is in some ways very unique because it has this reserve of energy. So if you, we also study thirst in my lab and drinking, and you don't have a reserve of water in your body, right? Um, and that's true for basically everything else. But for fat, we have this, this, this reserve of energy. And so it's very important that uh, the brain know uh, how much remains and then adjust behavior uh, uh, in accordance with that so that, so that you, know, you know how urgent it is to get the next meal. Um, and so the thought is that the major signal of the level of body fat that we have is leptin. It's this hormone. Uh, it was discovered, it was cloned in 1994, actually by my postdoctoral advisor, a scientist named Jeff Friedman at Rockefeller mm -hmm. University, although its history goes back way before 1994. So the, the sort of story behind leptin is that um, there's a 
facility called Jackson Labs that you, I'm sure, are familiar with in Maine that um, since the 1920s has been raising mice and selling them to academics, basically, who study physiology and behavior. And so they breed thousands of mice. So they're sort of a, a nonprofit organization that distributes mice to the scientific community. And at some point in, in the 1950s, um, they spontaneously, just because they were breeding so many mice, they came across some spontaneous mutations, um, mutant mice that were extremely fat, like the fattest mice they had ever seen. These mice just eat constantly. They're just enormous, three times the size of a, of a normal mouse. And um, it's all body fat. So they're just, they're just hu these huge uh, 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 fat mice. And they came across several different um, muta mutant strains that um, all had the same phenotype in the sense that they were all extremely fat, all extremely hyperphagic. But they could tell, even in the 1950s, that these mutations were on different chromosomes. They didn't know anything about how to identify the genes at that point. That was just science fiction. But they knew that there were chromosomes and they were on different chromosomes. And so they labeled one obese, one of these mouse strains obese, and the other one diabetes. But they were basically the same. And so people wonder for a long time, well, what, what's going on in these mice? Then there was a scientist at Jackson Labs, Doug Coleman, who had the idea, what if we do an experiment where we connect the circulations of these two different strains of obese mice and test the hypothesis that maybe there's a circulating factor, a hormone that is produced by one of these strains and that controls appetite? Because at that point, insulin was known, glucagon was known. There were some hormones that were known that were involved in metabolism. So it was logical that there could be a hormone that uh, perhaps regulates body fat levels. And what they found, which was, which was remarkable, when you attach the OB strain to the DB strain, so you basically connect their circulation, so hormones are, are, tr are transmitted between the two, um, the OB mouse, that strain dramatically loses weight. In fact, within a couple weeks, it looks like a normal mouse. It just stops eating, it loses almost all of its body fat, and it essentially in all respects becomes a normal mouse. The DB mouse, nothing really happens. It still remains obese and still remains hyperphagic. And based on just that piece of data, Doug Coleman hypothesized that what was going on is these two mutations were mutations in a hormone and a receptor. The OB mouse had a mutation in the, recept in the hormone that comes from fat, so it couldn't produce this hormone that comes from fat and signals to the brain how much fat you have. And the DB mouse has a mutation in the receptor, so it can't sense the hormone. Um, and that was just an idea, it was a hypothesis. Um, but, you know, in the 1980s, as technology advanced, as it became, you know, there's molecular biology had been invented, it became possible to clone genes. Um, a number of people tried to identify what are the genetic mutations uh, uh, that are occurring in these mice that make them so obese. And Jeff basically cloned leptin and showed that, in fact, Doug was exactly right. The, the OB mutation is a mutation in this hormone, leptin. Uh, and later, uh, Millennium Pharmaceuticals showed that the, the DB mutation is, in fact, a receptor. And it was an important discovery for a couple ways, for a couple of reasons. One, because this OB gene is just expressed in fat. It's exclusively impressed, expressed in adipose tissue. And uh, how much it's expressed is directly proportional to how much body fat you have. So as you gain weight, the expression of this hormone increases in a linear manner, and then it's secreted into the blood. So the level of leptin in your blood is a direct readout of your body fat reserves. This receptor for leptin, the leptin receptor, the, the functional form of it is expressed almost exclusively in the brain, and it's expressed in all of the brain regions that we knew from previous work were important for appetite. So basically the expression of this receptor gives you a map in the brain of the neurons that control hunger. And so what happens is basically when you lose weight, uh, the levels of leptin in your blood fall because basically you've lost adipose tissue. The absence of that hormone sends a signal to all these neurons that have leptin receptors in the brain. They're not getting that signal that uh, I'm starving. And it basically that initiates this entire homeostatic response to starvation. So a big part of that is um, obviously increased hunger, but it's also decreased energy expenditure, decreased body temperature, um, even decreased fertility um, because you don't want to reproduce if you're starving. Less spontaneous movement. Less spontaneous movement, mm -hmm. all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, um, and so the thought is, which I think is absolutely correct, is that this, this hormone leptin is, is part of this negative feedback loop from the fat to the brain that basically tells you about your level of body fat reserves and how urgent it is to find the next meal. Fascinating. As I recall, um, Amgen Pharmaceuticals owned the patent for leptin in hopes that it would become the blockbuster diet drug, the logic yes. being that if you were to take this hormone somehow or activate this pathway, that the brain would be tricked into thinking that there was more body fat, more energy reserves than there was, and then people would uh, 
basically be less hungry, eat less, and lose body fat. Yes. What happened with that? Do we know why it did not work? Yeah. So that's a great question. So um, there was a lot of excitement when leptin was cloned because it was thought basically we've cured obesity. Um, there was an auction at, for the patent Amgen one. I think it was something like twenty million dollars upfront payment plus royalties, which at the time was—I mean, it still is a lot of money, but even yeah, more but money nowadays. It would be, it would be um, a drop in the ocean compared to what companies will invest exactly. into potential diet drugs. Exactly. So, but but you know, at the time, um, and still a, a lot of money today. Um, and uh, they did a clinical trial, gave obese people leptin subcutaneous injections of this hormone, and they didn't lose a lot of weight. Um, and the question was why. And so what was subsequently revealed is that the challenge with leptin is that individuals who are obese um, do not have low levels of leptin for the most part. They actually have high levels of leptin. And so what they have is a state of leptin resistance. So it's analogous to someone who has type two diabetes. It's not because they lack insulin, it's because they actually have over time a high level of insulin. And so target tissue stop responding to insulin. And the thought is that it's the same way in, in obesity and leptin. Now, subsequently, they went back and did um, a reanalysis of that clinical trial and asked, what if you take all of these people and stratify them according to their starting leptin level? So some people have relatively low levels of leptin, some have higher, some have really high levels of leptin. And then ask if we reanalyze the data, um, how, uh, how effective is leptin? And as you might expect, the people with the lowest levels of leptin, they lost the most weight when you gave them this drug. And the people with the highest levels of leptin lost the least weight. So there is a rationale there for why, um, for, for a scenario in which leptin could work, either among the subset of people who just have, for some reason, lower levels of leptin. These aren't people with mutations like the OB mouse. They have some leptin. They just don't have unusually high levels. Or alternatively, after weight loss. So after you've lost a lot of weight, your leptin levels plummet. They become very low. And that part of the reason, it's a big part of the reason it's so difficult to keep weight off is because those leptin levels are so low. And so it's been thought for a long time that that, that is a scenario where treatment, treating people with leptin uh, uh, could be really useful to help them keep the weight off. Why it never made it as a drug for that application, I really don't understand. It has something to do, I think, with the pharmaceutical industry, with the economics, with a, a bunch of other issues that aren't necessarily scientific. Um, but I think there's still, in the future, is a possibility that it could come back for that indication, especially now that we have these GLP-1 drugs and now there's just millions of people losing so much weight and perhaps they want to transition to a different kind of drug uh, to keep the weight off. Thank you for tuning in to the Huberman Lab Clips channel. If you enjoyed the clip that you just viewed, please check out the full-length episode by clicking here.